I have been discussing extraction of ferroalloys and ferroalloying elements. Now, do not be confused when I use them intermittently. Ferroalloying elements are those which go into making ferroalloys and I have been repeating that very often we need these alloying elements in steel and it is easier to add these alloying elements as ferroalloys. But there are times when we want the ferroalloying elements in elemental form for other uses. They are not always used for alloying, there are other uses. So, let us go back to uh, a slide I had shown earlier. These are the common ferroalloys <coughs> ferrochromium, ferromanganese, ferrovanadium, ferrotungsten, ferromolybdenum, ferroboron, ferrozirconium, ferrochromium, manganese 3. And I would repeat this. We want these ferroalloys because these elements called ferroalloying elements are required for alloying of steel. It is easier to produce them in ferroalloy form and then add to steel. So, it is not only easier to produce, they will mix very quickly and and that is the advantage of why you are producing them as ferroalloys. But sometimes we need them in elemental form. I have given you example of how chromium is produced from chromite by sodium carbonate roasting, getting making a chromate and then treating that with sulfuric acid to produce Na2Cr207. And then we, from there we produce pure chromium oxide which can go for electrolysis or aluminophenol reduction. Now, there are many oxides in nature which we which will go for ferroalloying elements, but we sometimes need them as pure metals also. And there are elaborate flow sheets for making of these elements by first always producing pure oxide. Like here is an example for vanadium oxide, which comes from a uranium ore that contains a 0 0.2 to 0.4 percent U2O8, 2 percent vanadium B2O5. The idea here is not we want to make ferrovanadium. We, we first we will try to, we are thinking, you first try to produce pure Fe2O3, a pure V2O3, and then worry what to do. Now, it has to go through a many, many chemical steps. Some of these steps you need not answer, but there is a very logic for all these things, why we do. Eventually, why we try to get everything in a solution, then by controlling pH, uh, we, we get different precipitates. We can precipitate out uh, uranium oxide, we can precipitate out vanadium as an oxide. Similarly, There are tungsten ores, incidentally we do have some tungsten ores in Rajasthan, place called Degana, but very low grade. Because tungsten is very heavy, using gravity separation, we can get a concentrate going up to 60 percent WO3. Again that goes for soda roasting, which is a very standard procedure to produce Na2WO4, grind, you leach by water, filtrate you get rid of the residue, you get a soluble um, compound of tungsten. Then by hydrochloric acid, we can a treatment, we can precipitate WO3. If you want pure tungsten, then you have to start with WO3. Similarly, tantalum, niobium. Incidentally, the word columbite there are two words for the element niobium, columbium as well as niobium. So, what we are saying columbite is actually ore of niobium and tantalite. Now, here let me make a 
a small uh, a, a remark. You will find it is a columb columbite tantalate ore. There are these two elements are called twins, columbian and tantalum. No matter what you do, it is very difficult to separate them. There is another twin like this called zirconium hafnium. No matter what you do with zirconium, there is always some hafnium associated and whatever happens to the zirconium compound will happen to the hafnium compound. But sometimes we do not want the twins together, we want them separated. Now, this is a subject of a lot of studies in laboratories. How you separate zirconium and hafnium? How do you separate niobium and tantalum? I myself have worked on zirconium hafnium uh, separation for a long time, but that is not the subject of my discussion now. Here, there is an elaborate flow sheet. Here, the aim is not only to treat these oxides to come to a pure oxide, the concentrate, but also to separate niobium and tantalum. And you see what a complicated flow sheet one has to adopt and at stages one has to use hydrofluoric acid, which is a very dangerous reagent. And but there is no simple way of separating tantalum and niobium, but there is a process where you separate tantalum and niobium, these two are separate. So, what I am saying there are many oxides in nature uh, from where we first produce a pure oxide and then try to produce the metal. In many cases, many such oxides will be taken into a halide form by chlorination and then from the halide it will be easier to produce the metal either through electrolysis or through an aluminothermic reduction. That I will discuss in the next module when I disc uh, actually next to next when I discuss metals from halides. Anyway, I will stop talking about production of uh, ferroalloying elements in elemental form now. I will go back to ferroalloys, because that is the main subject of our discussion. Why do we need ferroalloys? I said they are very important. There are some uses mentioned here, but I will discuss the uses little more de detail little later. We need ferroalloys for alloying. That is that is well accepted that you know steel properties have to be modified by if you want to have a stainless steel you have to add nickel and chromium. You will not add pure nickel metal or pure chromium. You will adjust the composition by adding ferronickel and ferrochromium. But apart from that we also need uh, ferroalloys for many other things. We need them for deoxidation of steel and other gases too. When there is, in after all steel making is a process of oxidation. I look at the way uh, ferrous metallurgy works. You have iron ore, oxygen level very high. In the blast furnace, we have a reducing atmosphere. We produce pig iron under reducing conditions oxygen level is low. Now, we remove impurities from pig iron by an oxidation process, either in, um, in a say from uh, bottom blown or top blown converter whatever you blow oxygen. So, initially we removed oxygen, then we again add oxygen. So, when we get a steel, the, the oxygen level is high, we need to remove that again and we have to use a deoxidizer. And very often these ferroalloying alloys are used as deoxidizers because the ferroalloying alloying elements form very stable oxides. <coughs> they also form stable nitrides. So, they are used for removing both oxygen as well as nitrogen. Titanium and this is zirconium not zinc they form stable nitrides, whereas ferrosilicon, ferromanganese, ferrotitanium are usually used as deoxidizers. So, if you want to add nitrogen, we will go for ferrotitanium, ferrozirconium also. 
Then ferrosilicon, ferronickel are also added to control graphite morphology in cast irons. And ferro alloys I mentioned can be produced by aluminothermic reduction. Then you get a ferro alloy which has no carbon. They can also be produced by carbon smelting in arc furnaces. In that case, you will have carbides in that uh, in the ferro alloys and you have to find a way of removing the carbon from the ferro alloys. To remove excess carbon, one has to introduce an element which reduces solubility of carbon. During carbon reduction, impurities are removed by oxidizing slags, controlled oxidation of carbon or finally, oxidation of carbon under vacuum. These are the three standard techniques of removing carbon from high carbon ferroalloys. I will discuss that uh, little later, but first of all, let me spend some time on uses of ferroalloys and what kind of resources we have in our country as regards the sources are concerned. Now, unfortunately, I have not made a slide out of this, so I would like to read out uh, something about ferroalloys and their uses. Ferrochrome both high and medium carbon ferrochrome. Carbon can be 2 to 8 percent or chromium 78 to 68 to 71 percent. They are used to supply chromium for stainless steel making and to produce alloy steels for mining and milling operation. So, we need ferrochrome in many, many applications. I am mentioning here that it is for adding chromium to steel and also for making various kinds of alloys that will be required for mining and milling applications. We need low carbon ferrochrome where carbon should be as low as 0.02 to 2 percent for finishing additions in stainless steel making. There are some requirements in stainless steel making where carbon cannot be tolerated there it has to be low carbon ferrochrome. Ferrosilicon is mainly used as a deoxidizer in the steel industry that we have an oxidized bath, add ferrosilicon, silicon will react with oxygen, oxygen remove as um, silica. Ferrosilicon promotes formation of graphite as I had mentioned and by decomposition of Fe 3 C. So, it also used to produce malleable iron containing nodular graphite. Limited additions of silicon to low carbon steel improves tensile strength, yield strength and impact strength. And Fe Si carbon alloys silicon up to 4.5 percent are suitable for magnetic material with high resistivity and permeability with reduced core losses. So, all kinds of applications. Why do we need ferro tungsten? Ferro tungsten is for manufacturing of tungsten steels. You know, tungsten imparts hardness. So, for high speed steel, such as steels having ability to retain hardness at high temperatures and therefore used as a machine tools, we need tungsten in steels. So, we have to use them uh, add as ferro tungsten. A typical composition will be tungsten 18 percent, chromium 4 percent, vanadium and cobalt. We, can, we also have precipitation hardening tungsten alloys, iron vanadium. Ferro vanadium is used for imparting fine grain size to steels. That improves mechanical properties. Ferro manganese of course, without ferro manganese the steel industry will be dead. Ferromanganese is of vital importance. It is required for deoxidation of steel, desulfurization of steel. For every ton of steel that we are producing, we need 5 to 6 kg of manganese. So, as we expand the steel industry, 
ferromanganese production also has to increase. Alloy steels containing almost 14 percent manganese are used in manufacturing of jaw crushers, railway equipment like tracks, points, crossings and switches. Without manganese in steel is unthinkable and the manganese added as ferromanganese. High carbon ferromanganese is generally used for additions to carbon steel. Where carbon is tolerated in steel, you can add high carbon ferromanganese, but low carbon variety will be used only for alloy steels where it is necessary to have low carbon levels. Ferrozirconium is sometimes used for deoxidizing, sometimes for scavenging and then zirconium treatment improves shock resistance properties and therefore, steels are treated, steel such thus treated are used for tools like rock drills. And lastly, ferro titanium. It is also used for deoxidation, it is also used for alloying, it is a strong carbide stabilizer and titanium is used in austenitic stainless steels to prevent intergranular corrosion. Its addition also improves hardening characteristics of plain chromium steel. So, variety of applications of these uh, ferro alloys and we need them or steel industry cannot survive without the ferro alloying industry. What about India's situation as regards uh, the ferro alloys? We are very fortunate in having good deposits of chromium and as I mentioned there most of it is in Orissa. It is estimated that are about 3.5 million tons with 1 million ton of chromium content higher than 48 percent. They are available. Manganese total deposits about 180 million tons, about 120 million tons with manganese content higher than 46 percent. So, India is rich so far as chromium and manganese deposits are concerned. Tungsten is very limited deposits. It comes in the form of wolframite with tungsten content. It can be very high, but the ores are very low grade. Titanium, India has huge deposits of titanium. Extensive deposits estimated at about 250 million tons. Ilmenite, which is FeO dot TiO2 or rutile, only TiO2. Uh, they are found mixed with beach sands along our eastern coasts as well as western coasts. And vanadium, also we have total deposits about 20 to 25 million tons, with vanadium content only 0.2.5 to percent. So, these are the resources we have. A very common thing that we need is ferro-nickel that has to come from nickel sources that is very limited in India. We do not have nickel resources as such, but we do have nickel as chromite overburden means in the chromite mines in the top layer about 0.6 to 0.8 percent nickel is available. It has been loaned for a long time. So, before chromite mining the top layers are separated out and they have been kept there for many years now and they have made mountains in Sukinda valley of Odisha you see big hills those hills are have this chromite overburden containing say 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 percent nickel on the whole huge amounts of nickel is there, but we still have not got a process of process for extracting that nickel. We are working on it. I will come to this in a later um, thing where we talk about metals from sulphides. Nickel also comes from sulphides. Nickel also comes from oxidic sources. Maybe I will take it up in this lecture also, but in India good nickel reserves are not there, but nickel is associated with chromite reserves, low grade nickel reserves are there. So, this 
India has all the reason to go for a vibrant ferro alloy, uh, ferro alloy industry. And it is happening also, there are many uh, ferro alloy plants. Now, I will now not discuss aluminothermic reduction. I have given an example of aluminothermic reduction. Say in the case of manganese, you can produce the metal. If you want to produce ferro alloy, then all you need is iron addition. But generally, for large scale production of say ferrochromium, ferro nickel, ferro titanium, etcetera, we need to go for a carbon reduction, which will give carbon in the product. Then finally, you have to find a way of removing the carbon. And as I mentioned, there are three standard techniques for getting rid of the carbon in the ferro alloy. First will be having produced that ferro alloy, which has carbon, it has to be treated by an oxidizing slag. The oxidizing slag will oxidize the carbon and remove it. The other thing could be remove the carbon by oxidation through oxygen injection. Now, this may sound very interesting that suppose you have a ferro alloy like ferrochrome at high temperature, it has carbon and I say you can remove the carbon by injecting at high temperature oxygen into the bath. You may think this is going to oxidize chromium or oxidize the ferro alloy. This does not happen because if you go back to the Ellingham diagrams, you will find at very high temperatures carbon monoxide is becoming more stable as compared to the metal oxide. So, if you inject oxygen into the bath, you have an exothermic heat heating the bath and if the bath temperature increases, oxygen will react with carbon in preference to chromium or manganese or iron. So, it in the industry very often carbon is removed by oxygen injection and that is not oxidizing ferro alloy, it is removing carbon because that carbon monoxide is now thermodynamically more, uh, more feasible, more stable. The third will be something very obvious. If you apply vacuum and then CO would get eliminated because carbon monoxide will form in the gaseous form. So, the reaction of formation under oxidizing conditions carbon will form carbon monoxide and by vacuum treatment you can remove. These are the standard techniques. If, if I uh, discuss one particular process like say for ferrochrome, this will become clearer. Okay. Now, let us proceed. In this book that I have referred to many times, my book on non-ferrous metals production, many pages have been devoted to production of individual ferro alloys. Whatever has been written is still very sketchy because there can be a course on ferro alloy production which will run for one whole semester. But you do not have to go know all about ferro alloy making, you need to know the principles. So, just whatever I am saying now and little bit from the book should do. Let us talk about production of low carbon ferrochrome. Now, generally how do you produce ferro alloy by carbothermic reduction? You will have an electric furnace, you will take the concentrates, so chromite, manganese ore or whatever, you bring in carbon, you reduce, you get the metal because there is always iron, iron, iron oxides there also or you add iron ore and you get iron that element, you also get carbon because the ferro element will, element will form carbon. And then you find a way of 
refining that, as I said, by various processes, treatment with oxidizing slag or by raising it to high temperature, oxygen induction or the vacuum. Now, here is a method called triplex process for production of low carbon ferrochrome. How do we go in here? We will start with chrome ore. It will be smelted using by reducing agent is coke. Of course, you will also add fluxes like quartz, lime, so that you produce a slag. That slag will go to waste. It will only have 3 percent Cr2O3. The alloy we will produce by smelting would have 68 percent chromium around. It would have some silicon because from quartz some silicon will come. It would have some carbon. So, here is the carbon that we would like to remove. We will crush, we will smelt again, adding quartz and coke, we will produce an alloy which will now have more of silicon. We will crush chrome ore, lime, refine, we can produce a slag that has 20 to 23 percent Cr 2 or 3, it will go back to smelting and it will produce low carbon ferrochrome. So, there are many, many flow sheets about different kind of ferroalloy. Now, one ferroalloy that attracts us is something that I would like to mention here and that is ferro nickel. Now, a little while ago I told you that India does not have nickel resources, but India does have nickel in the in chromite overburden. So, let me discuss a possible way of getting nickel from that chromite overburden. Now, again what is chromite overburden? We have chromite in chromite mines. In the top layer is what we call overburden. This layer contains nickel to the extent of say 0 0.4, 0 0.7 percent. And in the chromite mines of Orissa, they have been all removed before mining. They have stockpiled in big hills in a place called Sukinda, Sukinda hills. There are millions of tons there now. So, if you consider this percentage of nickel in them, we already have a reserve of thousands of tons of nickel staying there without serving any purpose. So, a lot of effort has gone into finding a process of extracting nickel from this chromite overburden. And the laboratory with which we were, I was associated, a regional research laboratory at Bhubaneswar, now it is called Institute of Minerals and Materials Technology. It took up this problem on a priority basis. We are not the first to do that. National Metallurgical Laboratory also studied this problem some 30 years ago. And the essential approach for treating similar overburdens is very well known. All over the world, people extract nickel from sources where nickel can be 1.1, 1.2, maybe maximum 1.8 percent nickel. And for that, standard pyrometallurgical techniques are available. Actually, we have gone and seen many plants in other countries, but nobody has worked with any starting material with less than 1.1 or 1.2 nickel. Then our first thing was to see can we do something to this 
fairly rugged overburden and bring it up to something like 1.1 per cent mercury. We found it is possible. We found a way of using a flotation process to upgrade nickel to almost 1.1, 1, 1, 1 to 1.1 1 .1 by using a flotation process. And the idea was simply to take out the gang material by flotation. And we found that the nickel is mostly associated with iron. After what is the rest, rest is silica, iron, etc., etc., with, with a mineral called goethite, it is there. Then the standard technique all over the world is this that you have nickel, say roughly 1 percent starting material. it will be, it will go through a open hearth or a rotatorial reduction process. It has to go through a reduction step. Now, in the reduction step, nickel is very easily reduced to the metallic form. And if you have the Fe2O3 and other things, you can reduce to something like Fe3O4, this we can magnetically separate. Or we can take this, try to find the leaching process and selectively take out nickel. So, many, many such approaches have been tried out to get a starting material where nickel percentage will be high. Then attempts have been made to produce ferro-nickel by ox melting. Now say hypothetically, we have a starting material with x amount of nickel and y amount of iron plus gang, gang means silica etcetera etcetera. You want to reduce it by carbon, you go to a high temperature. Now, you should know that nickel oxide is very easily reduced. it does not need much partial pressure of CO, it is very easily reduced. So, if you have a starting material which has some nickel and uh, it has some iron oxides, it is very easy to produce nickel. But the, now the question comes is balancing between what will it produce? It will produce ferro nickel because iron will also be reduced, nickel will also get reduced. Now, if you continue reduction for a long time, then you will get more nickel out, but you will also get more iron out. If you do it for a small time, you will get initially very pure nickel, very high grade ferro nickel, but recovery of nickel will not be enough. So, we have a contradiction here. If you want higher grade ferro nickel means nickel percentage more low then total nickel recovery is low. Now, if you settle for lower grade ferro nickel means nickel content is lower then total nickel recovery can be high. Try to understand the dilemma. I have a starting material which say has 1 percent, 2 percent nickel oxide or whatever. You put everything in a electric arc furnace reduced by carbon. It also has iron oxides. So, carbon 
will very easily reduce the nickel initially, but nickel oxide reduction will take time. You have to balance between the grade of ferronickel you want and the total nickel recovery. If you want to take out every amount of nickel that is there in the ore, then we will continue the reduction process for a long time. In that process, you will end up with a lot of iron also in ferronickel. If you do not continue for a long time, you will get something which has higher percentages of nickel, but total recovery of nickel from the initial charge would be low. So, these balancing acts one has to try out. Look at the economics. A lot of work is going on in India on this, but we have in those Sukinda overburden huge amounts of nickel there. And remember, India needs maybe 20, 30,000 tons of nickel per year or even more for alloying purposes. All that nickel is being imported. Nickel is a strategic uh, metal, without that you cannot do. We have the resources, but they are low grade resources, they are not high grade resources. And we have to develop our own technology. Internationally, there is no technology suitable for these low grade resource, resources. But we are almost there, we can do it, but then there are many problems why although something looks okay on paper in the laboratory, the technology is there, there can be a commercial process, but there are many reasons why it does not go and make an industry. Okay? So, I think with that I will conclude uh, a module five about production of metals from oxide. Before I end, I would introduce the next module, which will be module 5. Now, in the next module, we are going to discuss production of metals from sulphide sources. And what will be the metals? They are the metals of ancient times, copper, lead and zinc. These sulphides are often found in nature all mixed together, because the sulphides intermix very well. Another peculiar thing about sulphides is they are very good solvents for precious metals. Now, we think of silver, gold, platinum etcetera. We do not find them lying around in earth's crust. Of course, there are uh, there is uh, something like Subarna Rekha where gold particles are flowing down the river. There were gold chunks of gold available in the new world when the uh, Spanish conquerors came to uh, South America. They were amazed to hear stories of uh, cities paved with gold. It was not exactly true, but it was almost true, because there are huge amounts of gold was there with the original inhabitants who were later called Red Indians. They had huge amounts of gold in them. And that is what drew more and more uh, people from Europe who massacred them left, right and center. At that time, maybe native gold was available in plenty, but now gold will be found as grains embedded in rocks or in sand and everything. But gold, platinum, silver, etcetera are also there in sulphide deposits, because millions of years ago when earth formed and there you know you had oxides and sulphides and all kinds of things, the sulphides dissolved these. So, we will find the sulphide metallurgy will not only give us the metals of ancient times, they would also give us as byproducts, as very valuable byproducts, precious metals. And very often, many processing steps, the cost of processing steps would be met by the value of the byproducts that will come in sulphide metallurgy. Now, sulphide metallurgy, as should be obvious to you, is a 
very, very old thing and people have been working on sulphides for centuries. So, many things that are done today have come from ancient time and only now people understand why those things are done the way they are done. But basically, I was concerned with general principles of extraction and refining. You have seen that you may have two oxides or three oxides which look similar, but the way the metals are extracted from them may be quite different. And even if a method is similar, there are intricacies which are very, very different. The time now has come to move on from oxides to another kind of starting material and they are sulphides. I was mentioning that sulphides are very good solvents. They mix amongst themselves, they also dissolve precious metals. But there are no sulphide deposits which are very rich, that is another problem. Like in oxides can be very rich deposits, deposits of aluminum, deposits of iron, deposits of magnesium, calcium, they can be very high in the metal content. For sulphide that is not true. But ancient somehow had found out how to start with this very low grade material also. Now, I would not go back to the ancient processes that I had discussed in the very beginning and it is not right to go into discussion of those things. But let me start with this problem today that what you do with a sulphide mineral where the metal content of copper or zinc is only about 1 percent or even less. There is no other source of that metal which is rich, richer in terms of the metal content. Now, fortunately, somebody found out a very exciting process called flotation for enriching such ore. Now, it is because of such discoveries which can be accidental or which could be results of trial and error that many metallurgical processes have evolved. In flotation, the whole idea is very similar to the way we clean our clothes. Now, when our clothes are dirty, why they are dirty? Because dirt particles are sticking to the uh, on the on the textile. Now, if you shake it, they would not go. If you put it in water and rinse, some will go, the rest will not go. But if we put our clothes in soap solution and you rinse the soap bubbles that come out that take out the particles of dirt with them. Why do the particles of dirt move up with the soap bubbles? It is because of some surface tension phenomenon that the dirt, dirt particles are attracted more to the surface of the soap bubble than to the surface of the uh, of the cotton uh, or textile. So, as the soap bubbles rise, they take the dirt with them and they float up. And if you take out the froth, you will find it is very dirty. All the dirt is in that. There is a similar process in the case of sulphides. I, I do not know who discovered it. Exactly the same process is called froth flotation. You create a froth using a frothing agent, and the whole idea would be 
when these bubbles rise, the particles of sulphide minerals stick to them. They will rise, whereas the gang, the dirt, silica, alumina, soil, etc., they will not rise. Now, this also means that you have to make the particles very fine, otherwise soap bubbles will not be able to carry them up with them. So, froth flotation will necessarily require also fine grinding. So, if you have an ore, sulphide ore, in which we have the metal sulphide, it has to be ground very fine, so that sulphur, sulphide minerals are in a very fine form. Then they will be treated to froth flotation. The, there are various reagents which create this froth and the bubbles when they rise, they will take the sulphide minerals with them and come to the surface. So, if the surface is cleaned off, we get a concentrate which can have 25 to 30 percent of the sulphide minerals. So, in one jump, we go from 1 percent or less to 25 to 30 percent uh, metal. Once you have that, you got a starting, you can start. So, in all sulphide metallurgy, the first step will be concentration, which is froth flotation. To introduce model 6, which I am about to start now, the learning objectives would be the complex nature of sulphides and sulphide metallurgy. Then we will go to discuss pyrometallurgical extraction process individual for copper, zinc, lead, nickel, etcetera, because nickel is also found as sulphides in many places. We will talk about hydrometallurgical extraction processes, because many of these metals, particularly zinc, can be extracted by pyrometallurgy as well as by hydrometallurgy. Then we will talk about something called process fuel equivalent that how do we analyze or compare processes from the point of view of energy consumption. For that, we will need a criterion called process fuel equivalent. Now, before I proceed further, you should know what are the general methods of getting metal from a metal sulphide. There are some very standard approaches. One is thermal decomposition. There are many sulphides which simply decompose on heating. Example is the mercury sulphide, cinnabar, HGS. All one has to do is to heat it, it will give mercury and sulphide. But it is an exception. It does not happen in, in all cases of sulphide. In other cases, we can go for roasting and subsequent reduction. Means from the sulphide, we produce an oxide by roasting, then you reduce by carbon, and that is very obvious. The third metal is very interesting, and it is elephant for copper. That you start with a sulphide concentrate, you roast not to produce an oxide of copper but only an oxide of the impurity element iron. And then that iron oxide is taken away in the slag, you are left with a sulphide of copper and iron that is called mat. So, in copper we will not produce copper oxide for reduction, we will produce what is known as mat, we will take the sulphide will roast it not completely, incompletely, so that the iron sulphide and copper sulphide are roast, getting roasted. Iron sulphide is incompletely roasted, most of it is forms oxide and is taken away, copper sulphide remains intact and we get a product of copper sulphide and iron sulphide, this is called mat. That mat goes for smelting. 
And that smelting is also of different kind. You don't have to reduce by carbon. We will see simply by controlled oxidation from the sulfide mixture, we can get copper straight away. So, that is the third route. Flash smelting is an improved uh, step, improved process of combining roasting and mass smelting. Then, if we can produce a pure metal sulfide, we can always go for metallothermic reduction also, because there are there are some metals like calcium, which can produce very stable sulfide, and so the these uh, base metals, sulfides can be reduced. Then there are hydrometallurgical processing, that the sulfide concentrate can be roasted to make oxide and leached. So, taken into solution and the from the solution by chemical treatment, solvent extraction, ion exchange, precipitation, we produce, finally we get a pure solution, we can electrolyze or whatever. So, that will be hydrometallurgical processing. Or we can take the sulphide, from there we can get a chloride and from the chlorides we produce the metal. And there is electrolytic refining of matte directly to pure metal that also has been tried. So, there is a varieties of options and that is what makes sulphide metallurgy very, very complex. In some cases, more, there are two or three ways it can be done and what we choose depends on economics, depends on the kind of circumstances in which you are and, and depends on the expertise you have. So, we will discuss these things in module 6 in detail starting from the next lecture. Thank you.